distinguished fellow panelists, sisters and brothers, my dear students, Namaskar and good morning. I would like to begin by paying my deep respect to the Holy Trinity who have been overseeing us, discoursing for the last couple of days of their teachings and contributions in making this planet Earth more peaceful and livable. I would also like to add my deep respect and gratitude to the organizers of this very extremely significant seminar and all especially to Shavi Dagrupanandaji Maharaj, Principal Sri Ramakrishna Vidya Mandir. But I would like to begin with a specific disclaimer. And that is, I am the most ignorant and illiterate person to be invited here and also to share my humble ideas in this gathering of extraordinarily endowed devotees as well as scholars. And so I think my presentation would be the humblest one. Be that as it may, this is my humble homage to the Holy Trinity. The essence of Sri Ramakrishna's beliefs and preachings was similar to that of Islam. Such a similarity was not providential or circumstantial, rather a product of Sri Ramakrishna's human, egalitarian and inclusive perception of religions. These are also the qualities of the core Islam. Essentially, all the religions, rebuilt or otherwise, carry a common message. Sri Ramakrishna's perception of Islam, as well as other religions, had origins in how he dealt deep into the codes of all these religions and imbibed the underlying spirit of the same. Thus his religious philosophy was anchored in a deductive, not inductive context. Perhaps unlike any other religion's personality throughout history he was the one to practice himself some religions, at least for some time, before emerging with perceptions or convictions vis-a-vis -vis these religions. This was this way of comprehending religion, other than his own, was for him without any alternative, as he was not literate enough to go for a fastidious reading of religious texts. He had, however, the right and endowed mind to understand the core message of every faith, and in which capacity he was found to have excelled than anyone else. Such an exercise left him with conviction in the essential commonality of messages of all religions and also the core of his preachings, Jatumat, Tatupat, Samari paths as there are views. To him, religions are different paths 
to reach a common destination. This was the Sri Ramakrishna's recipe for religious pluralism. Again, something not divergent from the spirit of the core Islam. Well, a juxtaposition of Sri Ramakrishna's ideas and essentials of Islam is attempted in this discussion. This is extremely exploratory. The discussion opens with a brief resume on the meaning and inclusive spirit of Islam. The section following sheds light on Sri Ramakrishna's encounter with Islam and his fallout on his religious psyche. The third section compares and contextualizes both these perspectives on religion. This section also highlights the essence of Sri Ramakrishna's religious philosophy. The final section puts together some relevant concluding observations. Section 1 Original Islam and Muslims Today In the recent past, both Islam and Muslims have been victims of maligned ascriptions. Such maligned ascriptions, however, do not instinct intrinsically relate either to this religion or its followers. While the original Islam is certainly not what it is made out by its errant followers, the Muslims supposedly state first in sticking to the pristine faith cannot claim to have done enough to read either their religion or themselves of such malign descriptions. As it is, uh, I'd like to interrupt here and interpose another reference to a work like this, which rather confounds the present scenario vis-a-vis -vis Islam and Muslims. For example, M. J. Akbar's The Islamic History this entire book is based on a wrong interpretation of a hadith and it does fit the western paranoia about the so-called extremist Islam. As it is, some Islamists and their outfits have spawned intolerance and terror in the name of Islam. They are also reported as well as found to have put in place their own distorted construct of intolerant, extremist and exclusivist Islam. Neither such Muslims nor their brand of Islam represent Islam and Muslims per se. Islam in its spirit and content is inclusive, tolerant and universal. In fact, Islam, like all other religions, is not purported to be the religion of a specific capability, and its major source book, the Holy Quran, for Muslims only. The language and terminologies of the Holy Quran are universal and egalitarian in content and message. Very rarely you would find the word Muslim or Islam in the Holy Quran. But mostly Allah addresses the diligence of this earth as Ya Ayyuhan Nasu, O mankind. For instance, when Allah is also described as Rabbul al Arabic word phrase, the meaning Lord of the universe should not be lost on Muslims or followers of any religion. In such a context, it would be quite illogical to suggest that only Muslims amongst the dirigents of this earth would enjoy the blessings and favor of Allah to the exclusion of other religionists 
or other people. Moreover, it may be noted that the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, is described with a, a universal appeal. Again, an Arabic phraseology, Uswatun Hasana, meaning the ideal for the whole world, as is stated in the words of Allah, quote, We sent thee not save as mercy for all peoples, Surah Al Anbiya, number 21, verse 107. Moreover, the Prophet is reported to have met the categorical statement that, quote, I have been sent as a guiding mercy, unquote. And the Holy Quran considers the whole humanity as ashaful makhlukat, meaning best of all creations, and humans khalifa tullah, meaning wise charons of Allah on the earth. It is therefore important to take note of the fact that the whole humanity is designated as either Ashraful Makhlukat or Khalifatullah, and not only Muslims. Another pertinent point to be made in such a context is that Islam is the generic name of a religion that had long been in evolution, and by the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the process of evolution had been declared by Allah complete. As Allah pronounced, quote, This day I have perfected your religion, for you completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for Islam as a religion. Surah al maida number 5, verse 3, and, quote, The religion before Allah is Islam, and, quote, Surah Al-Imran, number 3, verse 19. But I emphasize, Islam implies here a generic terminology for religion, not surely a specific religion. This is where Muslims do err, and because they do not understand the underlying meaning of the Quranic message. Most of them because Arabic is a very difficult language. Each and every word carries minimum 17 meanings, upward 36 or 7. So you need to be a very outstanding Arabic scholar to get into the heart of the meaning and of the messages of the Holy Quran. Such inclusiveness and egalitarianism of Islam is corroborated by some of the Quranic verses and hadiths, that is traditions, prophetic traditions. Some of the Quranic verses are, as I quote, We sent not a messenger except to teach in the language of his own people in order to make things clear to them. Surah Ibrahim, verse 14, uh, number 14, verse 4. And the same comment is also made in another surah, that is Surah Fatir, and taken together and interpreted rightly, both these verses give us the message that each and every community living in this world and who had also lived in the past, received an apostle from the Supreme Being. So no community in the world is without a God's messenger. So we would have to believe in every religion and every messenger. And there are also specific verses in the Quran to this effect. Again, quote, Mankind is of one nation, kanan nasu ummatan wahida. Surah Baqarah, number 2, verse 2, 13. Quote, O humanity, we created you from a single of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Surah Huzurat, number 19, verse 13. Quote, 
And if thy Lord had willed, he verily would have made mankind one nation, yet this is not differing. Unquote. Surah Hud, number 11, verse 118. And, quote, and were it not that Allah checks the people, some by means of others, there would have been demolished, very significant, monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is much mentioned. Again, Allah in Islamic parlance is a generic term. Allah means the supreme being. Even the Quran contains 99 names of Allah. Surah Hajj, number 22, verse 40. Moreover, by way of illustrating the illustrious how the illustrious companions of the Prophet felt or acted vis-a-vis -vis other faiths, a reference may be made to an example set by Hadrat Ali Rahmatullahi Alaihi. The fourth Khalifa or Khalif, while on a walk in the evening, a companion of him, after having seen Christians praying at a charge, remarked that Kafirs, the Arabic word meaning unbelievers, were praying, visibly annoyed. Hadrat Ali Rahmatullahi Alaihi remonstrated, quote, Do not call those who pray kafirs. Praying people cannot be unbelievers, which by religion he or she might belong to. This is the implication of this statement by Hadrat Ali. This incident may appear to be a poser to those of skivrantist and fanatic Muslims who are often found to call people of other faiths kafirs. We frequently hear our hujurs, the Mawlanas, calling people belonging to other religions kafirs, especially during the Friday prayer khutbahs, the sermons. It may also be inferred that Islam recognizes all the praying people, religionists, even if there are obvious ritualistic differences in how they pray. It is also to be noted that all prayers by all religionists are directed towards one supreme being, even if he is addressed differently in different languages, as I was referring to a little while ago. As per the Holy Quran, all the languages of the world are the creations of Allah. God, Bhagavan, Ishar, Paramishar, whichever name we call him by. Allah says in the Quran, He quote, He has taught him that's the human being speech and eloquence, unquote. Surah Ar Rahman number fifty-five verse four. That means we have at present in the world 6,900 existing languages. All the languages have one common origin. And that's all the languages are from the Supreme Being. In such a context, Muslims are exhorted for a benign and peaceful interfaith relationship vis-a-vis -vis the followers of other religions. For example, it is revealed, quote, Allah doesn't forbid you respecting those who have not made war against you on account of your religion and have not driven you forth from your homes, that you show them kindness and deal with them justly. Surely Allah loves the doers of justice. Allah only forbids you respecting those who have made war upon you on account of your religion forth and also driven forth from your homes and backed up others in your expulsion that you make friends and ally with them and whoever makes friends with them these are wrong towards Surah Mumtahina number 60 verses 8 and 9. 
how much and how far Islam emphasizes an inclusive and universal outlook on the part of its followers is manifested in its insistence on taruf, an Arabic word, meaning knowing each other and others. Taruf originates from the root word arf, which appears in the Quranic verse Huzura, number 49, verse 13. Taruf in Islam is a necessity which is raised to being a binding rule, but that Muslims in general do not follow such a principle is evident from the statement of an Islamic scholar. I quote, the need for taruf is deep-rooted, and what is happening is nothing but deviations of the original rules of human relations down the road of history, unquote. In fact, the need to know others and the urge for the same is integral to human psyche. And Islam has simply raised this to the plane of a principle entwined with faith. Considered more comprehensively, Taruf appears to be a philosophical rational of divine prescription for humanity to reach out to others by every possible means and create an order based on mutuality, not conflict, of interests and peaceful coexistence. <coughs> In the Holy Quran, Allah ordains humanity in the following language. Tatafakkaru fi khalqillah. Think over all the creations of Allah. Meaning Allah is omnipresent and manifest in all his creations. In one of the lectures, Rabindranath Thakur, I refuse to anglicize his last name as Tagore, although Rabindranath himself used to write and sign his last name as Tagore. And I have two reasons for not doing so. First, grammar. Grammar would not permit us to translate the proper noun. Second, Thakur is a Sanskrit word which carries a specific meaning as the highly respected person. But Tagore doesn't carry any meaning. It's simply the distortion of a very, very respectable Sanskrit word. For example, we very reverently address Sri Ram Krishna as Thakur Sri Ram Krishna. Can you address him as Tagore Sri Ram Krishna? If not, I refuse to use Rabindranath's last name as Tagore. Were Rabindranath alive, I would have argued with him. Anyways, so Rabindranath Thakur gave, as you all know, quite a few illuminating lectures which enlightened the minds of the Western people. One such lecture was titled The Relation of the Individual to the Universe, highly philosophical. And in this lecture, he highlighted the core Upanishadic message that is similar to this Quranic verse I have just quoted. That is the Upanishad. What does the Upanishad say is similar to what the Quran says. And in Rabindranath Thakur's language, which I quote, the spirit of the teachings of Upanishad is, in order to find him that's God, you must embrace all we are enjoined to see whatever there is in the world as being enveloped by God. I bow to God over and over again who is in the fire and in water, who permeates the whole world 
who is in the annual crops as well as in the perennial trees uncut rabindranath in the same lecture refers to gautam buddha as having repeated the same upanishadic and the quranic message quote the being who is in his essence the light and life of all who is world conscious is brahmana this light and life this all feeling being is in our souls and cut to these two quotes rabindranath added his commentary but tracing the points there in from his own perspective i quote him thus to attain our world consciousness we have to unite our feeling with this all pervasive infinite feeling in fact the only true human progress is coincident with this widening of the range of feeling all our poetry philosophy science art and religion are serving to extend the scope of our consciousness towards higher and higher spheres uncut well but islam as presented above may be at variance in most cases with islam of today either in practice or politically motivated distortions how distortions occur as may be exemplified by what i refer to a few minutes back a very seminal work by m j akbar an icon journalist but he has totally distorted islam and islamic history and there are many such instances well consequently a, a conscientious observer of islam and its followers may discover a distance between the two of course this may be the case vis-a-vis any practicing faith in the contemporary world in fact islam and muslim may be apparently synonyms but history and heritage of both prove that they may in most cases be antonyms and this is because of the difference between the faith and its practice by followers well now i switch to my second section titled sri ram krishna and islam islam in origin and pristine practice as a faith as presented in this discussion certainly came with the underlying message of sri ram krishna's religious philosophy in both cases there are common elements of pluralism and universality of religions both also emphasize conquered not discovered when it comes to faiths and their practices by followers who apparently divide as belonging to many faiths but essentially unite on codes a person's outlook depends on his personality type and psychological makeup so an analysis of his ideas and activities is to be certainly based on the kind of person he is and in fact what i am suggesting here is the psychoanalysis of thakur sri ram krishna we have a fine testimony of sri ram krishna's personality from no less an authority than max muller who writes scott he was a wonderful mixture of god and man in his ordinary state he would talk of himself a servant of all men and women he looked up on them all, all as god he himself would never be addressed as guru or teacher never would he claim for himself any high position he would touch the ground reverently where his disciples had trodden 
But every now and then, strange fits of God, consciousness came upon him. Unquote. It was no wonder that such a God-spirited person would put himself in the service of God and all his creations, including religions. In 1866, <clears throat> Gobind Roy, a Hindu guru who practiced Sufism, initiated Sri Ramakrishna into Islam. Sri Ramakrishna said, quote, he devoutly repeated the name of Allah over a cloth like that of Muslims, said their prayer five times daily, and felt disinclined even to see images of the Hindu gods and goddesses, much less worship them. For the Hindu way of thinking had disappeared altogether from my mind. According to him, after three days of having been a Muslim, he had a vision of a, a quote, radiant personage with grave countenance and white beard, resembling the prophet and marching with his body, unquote. In 1873, he had the same kind of exposure to Christianity and later on to Buddhism and Jainism also. The extent of the impact of Islam may be found by taking into cognizance the fact that it was Sri Ramakrishna who had exalted Girish Chandra Shen, who is popularly known as Bhai Girish Chandra Shen, to be the first translator of the Holy Quran into Bangla. Perhaps students of history are persons having had a bit of knowledge of history of Bengal know that Ramayana, Mahabharat and Bhagavad Gita were translated into Bangla during the rules of Alauddin Hussein Shah and his son Nusrat Shah, the sultans of Bengal between 1493 and 1532 by the great and famous Bengali poet Maladhar Boshu. So we have examples of the Hindu religious books translated into Bangla for the benefit of the common people here on the orders of the two Muslim sultans and the Muslim religious script, the Holy Quran, translated into Bangla by a famous Hindu poet. What a brilliant and scintillating example of communal harmony in Bengal. But very dearly do I come across uh, sufficient and adequate historical commentary on this sort of intercommunal harmony in the textbooks. Anyway, the translation was completed between 1881 and 1896. I have a copy of the original translation. This vernacular, and this is very enlightening, enlightening tafsir or translation of the Holy Quran. Anybody could understand the core message of the Quran by reading through Bhai Girish Chandra Shen's translation. This vernacular version of the Islamic holy book made the basics of, Isla of the Islamic faith understandable to the common Muslim masses. It was indeed a substantive contribution in taking Islam to the mass level and the catalyzer, as I would argue, of which was Sri Ramakrishna. Well, such a personality makeup and the mindset that Sri Ramakrishna was endowed with was as much the outgrowths of his inner self as those of an intermesticity between his inner self and the socio-religious milieu in which he was born and living through. The 19th century 
Bengal witnessed sharp inter-community polarization arising out of conflictual religious perceptions with consequential political complications as it was the Bengal of the 19th century as well as the whole of the subcontinent had to witness the inexorable process of the parting of ways between Hindus and Muslims supposedly on religious grounds. This was the supposed ground, as I say, supposed ground for such an unwanted historical outcome as, as I find there could be more tangible explanation for this historic or unwanted parting of the ways in the economic come political divide between Hindus and Muslims, which was created in the background of an exploitative colonial domination. I refuse to agree to the theory and thesis that in 1947 decolonization became inevitable in the context of the religious divide between Hindus and Muslims. There are Plenty of books written by both Hindu historians and Muslim historians. But I have challenged that in one of my articles, which was published in 2005 in the Indian Journal of Secularism, edited by Dr. Ali, Asghar Ali, engineer, wherein I argued that the developmental gap and divide between Hindus and Muslims created by historical factors in colonial India was mainly responsible for the divide of 1947. So we have to reread the historiography and rewrite the history of the 1947 decolonization. But as it was Sri Ramakrishna appeared to have concerned himself with the supposed religious ground of Hindu-Muslim dissension and by an unsought solution to which by addressing the cores of all religion which rule out as he found any such conflictual inter-religious milieu. The Sri Ramakrishna came up with a time-specific as well as time-transcending solution not only for his homeland but also for the world across. He was indeed a trailblazer in preaching the way he did, in thinking and preaching the way he did. Another pertinent point that contextualizes Sri Ramakrishna's ideas is the one to assess him against the egalitarian and inclusive tradition of Bengal, historical tradition of Bengal, of the many representative instances of such a tradition, reference may be made to two only. The first is what Chondidash, the folk poet of the 14th century Bengal, preached, quote, the highest truth is the man, no truth is higher than this. Shonohe manush bhai, shabarupare manush shutta taharupare dai. Again, there was Lalan, the 18th, 19th century devotional folk singer, of Bengal, who used to sing aloud, quote, cows are of different complexions, but their milk is of one color. Nanan Barun Gaviriyaki Barun Dud. While Chandidash and Lalan had the social perspective in their minds, Sri Ramakrishna, the religious one, but all of them shared the common vision of the unity and universality of Homo sapiens as a species inhabiting this planet Earth. Above all, convergence, not divergence, of the humanity as a species was their concern. Even in the context of the God-centric construct of the universe, Sri Ramakrishna, Gautam Buddha, and Rabindranath appeared to have shared a common perception and position. Thus, Sri Ramakrishna, as he appears with his teachings and preachings, was very much a product 
of a tradition that he belonged to and circumstances he lived through. Well, third section, the Sri Ramakrishna was a breed apart, even amongst the saintly and religious personalities known for their inclusive and egalitarian views and having a niche as promoters of interfaith harmony. None of them experienced religions other than their own the way Sri Ramakrishna did. Although a theoretician of religious pluralism and interfaith harmony, Sri Ramakrishna deduced his theories from personal exposures to religious variations. He found the ultimate truth common to all the religions. He found every religion as different pathways to a common destination that is reaching out to the Supreme Being. Another truth he imbibed was the godliness of all humans who are the creatures of the same Supreme Being. Again, he agrees with Islamic ethos insofar as Islam considers all humans Ashraful Matlakat, the best of all creations. So his conviction was that, quote, creeds and sects matter nothing. Let everyone perform with faith the devotions and practices of his creed. Faith is the only clue to get God, unquote. The assessment that becomes ineluctable about Sri Ramakrishna is that he was an empiricist vis-a-vis religions. Sri Ramakrishna's was a simple approach to the issues of religious tolerance and religious pluralism. Thus, contrary to the common perception, it is to be pointed out that he never meant to synthesize Shamanna religions. He simply believed in and preached for harmony of all religionists. This was a theory of interfaith harmony put into practice by his disciple Shavi Vivekanandam. Both of them, as I firmly believe, added a dimension, a new one indeed, to the present-day democratic discourse. Democracy is all about pluralism. In all spheres of life, much has been talked about and written for political pluralism as one, as an element of democratization. But nothing or little has so far been said of religious pluralism as another element in the democratization process. Well, I think that's quite an unrealistic approach to democratization issue because there have been quite a lot of studies by many scholars of both East and the West emphasizing how religion impacts on the personal psyche and how strong influence it exerts. For example, David Apter, an American social artist, he has done an exceedingly interesting work detailing how religion more than any other isms, any other ideologies, exerts more influence on the personality makeup of an individual. Either he is a theist or an atheist. Even one atheist, by denying the existence of God, denying the existence of any religion, he subscribes to a number of no's, and that becomes his religion. The, the least of no's becomes his religion. So religion, by disregarding 
and discarding religion, democracy can be put into its desired place. So that's why where he, I see Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda come in. So, but Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda did provide the recipe for religious pluralism by highlighting as we keep on harping as a mantra, Jato Maut Tato Paut. It is, I think, the basic mantra of Sri Ramakrishna. To say that this was only a recipe for religious harmony would be, as I believe, doing an inadequate justice to these two proponents of extraordinary perception and foresightedness bearing on the issues and problems of the contemporary world. Sri Ramakrishna concentrated on and addressed the religious roots of human conflicts and sought elimination of which through his empirically tested and deduced truth common to all religions. Well, I now would like to share my concluding observations. Islam today, in most cases, may appear to be at variance with the ideas of Sri Ramakrishna. But pristine Islam, to which he had exposure, is not. Both the pristine Islam and ideas of Sri Ramakrishna are relevant in overcoming the conflicts that keep the world disturbed and destabilized, at least religiously. Both provide perfect recipe for conflict resolution from a religious perspective. I think the teachings and preachings of Sri Ramakrishna as collected in his Katha Marito could very well be looked into and researched on from the perspective of conflict resolution. As you know, international relations do have a very rich field of investigation under the title Peace and Conflict. So I suggest there be a good deal to be said and thought of based on the Kotham Brito as prescriptions for conflict resolution in this turbulent world of today. This is, however, a recipe that awaits proper attention and consideration. It is true that of late there have been murmurings and musings on interfaith harmony and to many of which I have also been too, both in Bangladesh and outside Bangladesh in Europe, America also. But as it becomes obvious that the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and preachings of Swami Vivekananda had ample indications for how to achieve interfaith harmony and which predate the recent such endeavors. It is worth mentioning that these teachings and preachings provide a strong antidote to Samuel Huntington's Cassandra-like prognosis of a clash of civilization. Thank you, Dhanabad, Namaskar for bearing with me.